Hello again, folks. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to see you today. My name is Dustin Cormier. Welcome to episode two of How to Rock Astrology's new series, talking about the outer planets and their lords, according to the neotropical unfolding tradition of tropical Vedic astrology. It's a pleasure to have you here. As I said, my name is Dustin Cormier. I try to do this every time. Uh, you probably saw the first episode, so you know what my chart's all about. I'm a Leo. I'm a goofy Leo. Scorpio sun. Sagittarius moon. So, today is episode two. Uh, we're going to be talking specifically today about the associations that are traditionally given to the outer planets. Uh, specifically, we're going to be talking about how Uranus relates with Aquarius, Neptune with Pisces, Pluto with Scorpio, and whether that should be a thing. Uh, you know, it's still debatable, but uh, many people swear by it, and I even feel that there's something to it. But utility speaking, uh, functionally speaking, as regards to our capacity as researchers of astrology, I would like to start considering these outer planets as joker cards or ace, wild aces in the sense that they don't have these sign associations because we can have an easier time dealing with... Well, there's certain things that I wanted to express regarding the outer planets and their lords uh, through Vedic astrology, which is going to be much easier, much more sensible without the association of Uranus with Aquarius, or with Neptune, with Pisces, etc. Plus, I would still just like to challenge it, just because there are no scriptures regarding how these planets are supposed to be connected to these signs. I digress. That's the gist of what this whole video is going to be about, and I hope you guys enjoy it. I'm not going to dawdle too long. We're just going to get right into our discussion. Now, you saw this from our first slide. The reasons for this video is that we want to combine traditional Vedic astrology with traditional Western astrology and bring them together in order to find the satya, the peaceful dialogue, a peaceful dialogue that these two sides can have about discernible truths that are universally true between the two of them. Now, this is the gist of what our class is about today. In the modern Western astrology tradition, the outer planets are associated as Uranus, relating with Aquarius, Neptune, relating with Pisces, and Pluto, relating with Scorpio. Now, these associations of the outer planets with these certain signs may be true, but we ought to deeply consider that they have no scriptural backdrop in ancient lore because we only recently discovered these planets through technology. I will submit that it's possible that I think that the Greeks gave reference through their metaphysical intuition uh, of the outer planets. I think Aquarius might relate to one of the gods. Uh, or I'm sorry, Uranus might relate to one of the gods. Uh, same thing with Neptune and Pluto. Minerva, there's the mythos of Minerva for Pluto particularly. So there is space for these. Although, again, even the Minerva thing, Isabel M. Hickey made that association uh, through her intuition. So the thing about using the intuition is that it can be for good. And this is how we get anywhere. We use Uranus to intuit. And then we use Mercury to say, okay, so... Uranus knows, but Mercury needs to know that it knows. So how do we use our Mercury to get evidence for what Uranus thinks it knows? This is part of the fun of what we're doing as modern-day astrologers. Now, the uh, particularly the nature of all of these outer planets have basically been intuited uh by these Western channelers and observational psychologists. Uh, and 
you know, the basic guts of these planets outside the sign associations that we see here. The basic guts of these planets have been riffed on by all of these brilliant intellectual thinkers and channelers and intuitors. It's in particular this theme of the sign associations that I'm saying have, have disagreement. And this is what I'm trying to speak to today. So in order to get there, we're going to have to have a little conversation about something that is really at the bare guts of what astrology is. Astrology is what I would call an observational intuitive science, an observational science. What does that mean? Well, there, what I, what, what, what this is all about is that there are metaphysical precepts that are eternal, that keep recurring periodically, as periodically as the periodic table of elements. There's wisdoms that just always come through. No matter what planet you're on, if there's life on it, there's bound to be a spring, summer, fall, and winter. There's bound to be cardinal angles to the personality that can also come out. Whether you're pa aggressive, you're passive aggressive, or you're passive, or you're some combination of those two extremes. Whether you're a go-getter or you're an introverted personality, these are all different character arcs that are eternally recurring. And we can talk about them. We intuit them. The possibility for them are there. But it's only until we see people, until psychologists make up personality grids like Timothy Leary did in the 60s, uh, he made a personality grid for these types of personalities. And then he did statistical research on how many people have chosen that they display more of these characteristics. How many people have chosen that they display these characteristics and getting the hard data on it. So when it comes to how astrology came to be, we always it, it's always an interesting thing to ask. You know, it's this chicken or the egg scenario. So what came first? The signs in the sky or our intuition of the metaphysical precepts of astrology? This is what I mean. When we look out into the starry sky and we see Scorpio there in the stars and we notice that when the sun goes into that area and somebody is born there and somebody's born when the sun is in that place, we notice that they display certain traits. Now, the question is, is like, did we look out into the sky and say, there's a scorpion there. So we're gonna sit, we're gonna assume that the qualities of the person born when the sun is in that scorpion that they're going to be scorpion-like, that they're going to be tough and steely and aggressive and all the Scorpio things. Does that seem logical? The pro what I w am inviting you to consider is that the, the, the intuition of the metaphysical precepts of astrology were already in the sages' heads before they looked at the sky and decide to make a sign. The signs are just signs, after all. The constellations are only signs for marking what we know to be the cycles of the soul, moving with the sun in relationship with the earth. So, you know, even some cultures understand the psychology of Scorpio, and they understood astrology through different signs. Uh, the Native Americans understood the psychology of Scorpio. And when the sun was in the sky, they gave a certain in symbol which reflected the collective unconscious data for the sun being in that period in the sky. But they didn't call it a scorpion. What they looked up in the sky and saw was a snake. 
in the Native American wisdom, the snake takes the place of the sign of Scorpio. Of course, any symbol that relates to this snaky, serpentine nature of Scorpio will do. Because, again, I invite you to consider that our intuition came first, and the symbols, the gestation came later. Something that is just important to think about. So, Maya, mind, and the archetypes of the collective unconscious that we know as the zodiac, they unfold in dialectical, predictable patterns. That is the zodiac, you know? Uh, the self in one is the self in all. What happened as, as astrology came to be an observational behavioral science, thousands of years ago, clairvoyance had the sense of these metaphysical precepts of astrology. As time rolled on, people would be born with the sun or with other planets in, in this sign or that sign, Scorpio, Taurus, whatever. And the scientists, the behavioral scientists of the ages, these clairvoyant mystics, they would observe that people embody the traits of a certain type, of a certain quality, of a certain psychological archetype when the, a person is born with the sun being in the sky at this place. What happened is because, you know, people can see the sun, people can see the moon, people can see the cycles of Mars going around the sun. They can see and understand the cycles of Saturn going around the sun and Jupiter and all these things. They could see them. Astrology would make an intuition of what it means when Saturn is in its own sign in Capricorn, in the winter solstice vibe of Capricorn and Aquarius. They would intuit what that means because the precepts are there. And then it would astrology would refine itself by combining this intuition with experiments. Experiments were made, results were recorded, and time brings the cream, the truth, to the top, meaning scripture. This is how and why wisdom and scriptures are retained. Now, the, 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 the gestation, the, the, the generation, the genesis of this stuff happened like 3,000 years ago before people were even writing by brilliant Brahmins in the Vedic sense, but also just clairvoyant people, even in the Western tradition, who would see these things and then transmit them by words so that people would memorize them. And eventually people began to write them down and experiment with them for themselves. Because it was the seers who saw within themselves the whole zodiac unfolding with their sensitivity to the energy of the planets moving around. It was the astrologers who didn't have that insight, didn't have that perfectly brilliant karma. They would listen to the clairvoyant seers and they would observe, they would write down the, what the seers would say and that would become scripture. And they would further refine the scripture by writing in order to preserve it. And they would see it in the sky and observations would be made to keep it going. This intuitive style, followed by rational empiricism, an observation of what is being intuited, this is our only tool to quantify what we know to be true of astrology. It's a science. It's not just, it's not just intuition. We use intuition to get what we're going to be scientific about. Right? Now, this takes much time and statistical observation to get clear on all the things in astrology, uh, especially with regard to all the planets. It, it takes a long time. It, it's taken 3,000 years, and people still aren't all convinced that astrology is a thing, right? But for those who are into it, like you and I, my fellow student and friend, we have gotten the thread of what's already in our intuition through scriptures, through books, through 
clairvoyants who have been perpetuating and holding the torch for all of these things. Now this is especially so for the planets that can be seen by the naked eye or even just through the use of some primitive, very primitive telescopes from thousands of years ago. These, th these are the things that would allow us to see the cycles of all the planets revolving around the Sun. Uh, Sun, Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. These planets we've been digesting and stewing on the material of for like 3,000 years or possibly longer. But, you know, any, any, any of the astrological wisdom that we have has been stewed on and refined for a long time. And it takes a long time. Now, regarding these outer planets, the ancient, as we described in our first video in this series, the ancient seers knew that most astrologers couldn't calculate where those planets are. And therefore, they didn't bother speaking about them because they're brilliant sages that are only going to live so long you know all astrology is going to fall apart if they just talk about planets that no one can practically get a sense of the seers knew this the seers wanted to transmit something that astrologers of the day could use so that's why they didn't talk about the outer planets as we talked about in our first video this doesn't discredit the sages they knew about the outer planets and this shows that there's room for the framework in modern Vedic astrology for the outer planets. But as for quantifying them, we have to be very careful because we are using our intuitions as people who are not brilliant clairvoyant seers. Although some of the people we've seen like, uh, like Crowley, Edgar Cayce, Casey, uh, Jeffrey Wolf Green, these people are like really deeply... Uh, quite clair clairvoyant in their own ways. Uh, but even these people are not exactly sure of this particular thing that we're looking at right here. Uh, there's lots of disagreement regarding whether Uranus relates with Aquarius, whether Neptune relates with Pisces, or Pluto relates with Scorpio. <clears throat> at least so far as I know. And we're going to talk about how, you know, like I invite you guys to talk about scriptural bearings for the outer planets that go farther than at least like a thousand years if they're there. Now let's clarify. It's very well possible that these planets, the outer planets, that they do make associations with certain signs and that this reflects on their exaltation or debilitation points and even possible strengths and weaknesses in certain houses, right? Uranus and Aquarius, Neptune, etc. I would submit, you know, that what I'm trying to do when I get to my whole unfolding of all this is that I want to treat them as if they have no sign associations. I challenge the scientists of the astrology world, at least for the first bit, to try to get what the real bones of how to interpret these planets. Let's treat them as if they have no sign associations. This way we can bleach them to the bones and purely observe how they express themselves in a chart. At least that's what I plan to do in order to start fishing for some cross-cultural congruency regarding how to deal with these planets through the lens of Vedic astrology. Keep in mind that I'm not denying the possibility of these correlations. What I find personally that most of astrology, as Ernst Wilhelm has submitted many times before me, most of astrology has a bad habit of making inferences where there might possibly be none. For example, and this is what the whole, what all of them trying to say here, folks, is that to say with absolute assuredness, for example, that Pluto is any stronger by dignity or exaltation in, by being in Scorpio than it is anywhere else. It begs the question of authenticity regarding the source of such a claim. Uh, and this is why at this point, I would like to kindly invite anyone to partake in this discussion, if you please. If you have any clues as to the originating source of these claims, 
that these planets are associated with these signs uh, as they are in our modern astrological practices. Let me know if you know the scriptural sources for these, because admittedly, I don't know them. I've taken Vedic astrology as my official education, not Western. My gut tells me that they've been simply intuited to have such associations, and that's why we're openly discussing it now. As I said, that I think it's possible that the Greeks talked about Uranus and Neptune and Pluto in their mythos. Uh, that's ringing in my head right now. Um, but even as such, it's still not exactly... The Vedic camp would say that, you know, if you don't really know to the name point who the sage is that delivered the transcription from the divine insight of the Veda or of the divine insight of sublime intuitive human knowing if you don't know the exact sage who did it it's just hard to you never know if just maybe the Greeks were maybe at some point in the 1800s somebody came along and arbitrarily made the connection between Apollo or whoever represents Uranus with Aquarius or the figure of Minerva with Pluto as relating to Scorpio. We don't know how arbitrary that is. And I'd, I'd like to know if anybody has any clues as to where these are coming from. It's really a huge part of my whole shtick regarding all of this stuff. Now, what I plan to do, I plan to really unfold a whole ground of what Vedic astrology has to offer in, in interpreting the strength of planets uh, and connecting that to where the outer planet, Uranus, Neptune, whatever, if you've got Neptune in Capricorn, I plan to submit that Saturn then holds the energy of, because Saturn rules Capricorn, Saturn then holds the energy of Neptune. And its strength in the chart, what planets it's associated with, whether it's with its friends, whether it's good by dignity, Digbala, Shadbala, Lajitadya Vashtas, whether it's like one of the Jaimini Karakas, all these things. These Vedic things in my experience, I'm I'm interpreting things that no Western astrologer could possibly see the pertinence of, uh, according to my according to my research, and that's why I'm talking about that. I might sound arrogant, but this is why I'm doing these videos. I want other I want to share this and see if I'm just going crazy. So I digress. Calm down, Leo. Okay, sorry. Almost lost it there. Jeez. I'm treating this association of Uranus with Aquarius, Neptune with Pisces. I'm, I want to take it out in the same way that a lot of Vedic astrology... Uh, consider, how Vedic, bleh, consider how Western astrology deals with the nodes of the moon, Rahu and Ketu. Western astrology does not associate the nodes with any signs. Although, ironically, Vedic astrology does, although it's debated. There's, uh, there isn't agreement in, or there isn't a conclusive agreement in the Vedic scriptures regarding this idea that Rahu behaves similarly to Saturn, and it correlates with Saturn. Uh, it's an adjunct of Saturn. Uh, I'm in Ryan Kirksack's Astrology Apprenticeship Program, and I'm just picking this up right now in my courses. Uh, Saturn is like the arm of Rahu, and K2 is like the arm, uh, Mars is like the arm of K2. Uh, this is a sign association that not everybody agrees with. Uh, the particular source that I have gotten, that I've received from my teacher, Ryan Kirksack, 
is a fella named Satyacharya. It's not a title. Uh, it's a title, not a name. It's kind of like Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma is not his, Gandhi's first name. Mahatma means great soul. So Satyacharya means like truth speaker. And the book that this fellow, this sage, wrote or spoke of uh, is the Satya Jatakam. So in the case of Rahu relating with Saturn and Ketu relating with Mars, I agree with this correlation because most importantly, uh, sorry, I got to check. Can you guys see me? Just checking. Excuse me. I agree with this correlation because most importantly, it's included in at least one ancient scripture and apparently others that I don't know of, although I've heard of. Uh, and this includes primarily the Satya Jatakam by Satyacharya. B, because this is what I've been taught by my teacher, Ryan Kirksack, whose teacher was Ernst Wilhelm. Uh, these guys are, Ryan makes a point to let us, our stu students, know that he has a, an idea of where he's going with it based on Satyacharya, but that it is still debated. And they are admittedly still open to being wrong on this particular subject. Although Ryan gives so much information about Rahu and K2 outside of its associate their association with Saturn and Mars. C, uh, because I intuitively feel it is so. That's also why I agree with all of this. You know, these this is the nature of you as an astrologer. You gotta find your reasons for why you're going with what you're going with. And don't just you can't always just like hope that what you're feeling out is the right way to go because it's a science like we say do, 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 do. i'm just looking at my notes in my notebook here that's why i keep looking down just making sure i'm not missing anything you know so i digress about rahu and k2 uh i'm going to be talking more about them in this particular regard in another video. I, I can't wait to talk about it actually because I'm right stewing on it right now in my apprenticeship with Ryan Kirksack. So, it seems to me, yeah, this is the last word sort of before we get onto the chakras thing. Uh, let me make the point that again, uh, the work I'm doing here is not to persuade people to stop associating, you know, don't stop associating Uranus with Aquarius. Don't stop in your own, if you're into that, if that's where you're going, and if that's where your research is taking you to, then listen to your heart, because that's what I'm doing, right? Uh, but for my purpose, as someone who is a cross-cultural instigator, I want to relate these planets, the outer planets, according to the principles of Vedic astrology, as we would treat Rahu and Ketu without sign associations. Just to see what's there. To bleach the bones, like I said, of these planets. Because even without correlating Uranus with Aquarius, there's still much that we know about Uranus aside from that association. Spiritually speaking, as a possible figurehead of one of the chakras above the sixth chakra, uh, and from one of all of the intuitive channelers that I showed in the previous page, Jeffrey Green, Aleister Crowley, etc. There are things about Neptune that we know about Neptune, regardless of its association with Pisces. And we are going to eventually, once we get to it, we're going to relate these planets and quantify them as Vedic astrology does through the strength of the house lord that the outer planet is in. Again, like I said, if you have Neptune in Capricorn, you're going to look at the lord of that sign, which is Saturn, also the lord as it relates as a house lord. I'm a Leo rising, and I have Neptune in Capricorn. So Saturn holds sixth house energy for me because Capricorn is my sixth house. Neptune is in my sixth house in Capricorn. Saturn is my sixth house lord. My sixth house needs wherever Saturn is in my chart to function. 
It functions through Saturn. And so does Neptune. This is what I'm trying this is what I'm gonna be giving you guys. Okay. Uh, and the strength of Saturn is going to define the strength of Neptune. The strength of my capacity to deal with the lessons of Neptune. And that's by Saturn's dignity in the house that it's in. It's Shadbala, it's strength. Lajitadi Avashtas, which is like uh, the planet being affected by other planets, by its friends and its enemies. It's a Vedic, even the concept of planets having friends and enemies is something that's Vedic astrology specific. We're also going to talk about Rashi aspects, Jaimini Karakas, and the Dasha period emphasis. Jaimini and Dasha periods in particular are huge descriptors of how intense an outer planet experience is going to be. If an outer planet is touching your Atma Karaka, it's going to really ring deeply in your soul's experience, not only in this carnation, but the actions that you do in a period like that will affect your life for incarnations to come. Same thing with the Dasha period emphasis. If you're in a Dasha, uh, if you are in like Saturn Dasha and uh, like if I was in Saturn Dasha, whenever I have Saturn Dasha, it's a hard time for me because I have Neptune and Uranus in Capricorn together. So th that's always a hard, tough period for me, like deeply. I was almost suicidal in 2017 because of a Saturn period because Saturn is the ground for these two outer planets, right? So this is what I'm trying to, exp this, is, this is the blending I'm doing here. So I'm talking about all of this and I haven't mentioned how Uranus will, relates with Aquarius or how Neptune relates with Pisces because for me, I don't really need to. I could and eventually maybe that's where my mind is gonna go. But first, in order to plainly clearly talk about these planets in the Vedic sense, I'm going to cut their associations with those signs. And then other astrologers after me can explore and take the lead of these associations farther. I might even, I'll be rapping about them after this video with you guys. So uh, that is uh, the gist of what I'm really getting to with all of this. Now, I have another one last discussion in this video, uh, and it's, uh, it's just further considerations. This might take a little bit of time. I'm going to try to keep it concise because I want these videos to be nice and tasteful, tasty. So uh, this next little bit is specifically about the chakras. Um, yeah. So further considerations. I think the outer planets are invisible to the naked eye for a reason. Something I've been thinking about is that maybe not only they, are they invisible to the naked eye, but all, and we need instruments to see them, but also it's possible that they're not associated with the energy field that actually makes up our physical, emotional, mental bodies more of a spiritual thing that's transcendental. This is what I mean by that. Part of my conception involves, and this is a debate that we can have and talk about. Feel free to ask questions about it. Part of my conception involves a zodiacal transcript of the chakras, which comes from my teacher, Ryan Kirksack, and this is what we're viewing here. In brief, the seven luminaries are all contained in the six chakras. This is a picture, this picture of Earth with these chakras. This comes from Ryan, my notes from Ryan Kirksack's class. So I'm just going to explain a little bit what we're looking at here. So you can see a red, shitty looking Saturn is at the bottom, and then a purple, also shitty looking Sun and Moon are at the top. It's the purple chakras. The sun and the moon are the purple chakras. Saturn rules the red chakra. Where does that association come from? Well, it's actually quite logical. 
This picture looks confusing, but you'll see it a little bit better when I get to the next picture. Winter solstice, when the sun is in Capricorn and Aquarius. The sun is at its most dense, condensed place in the northern hemisphere. Uh, it has to do with the hemispheres with what we're talking about. It's a tropical phenomenon. In the northern hemisphere, when the sun is in Capricorn and in Aquarius, the first chakra is being activated. Think about the first chakra, what you know about it. It's, it's like heavy and it's like security and it's physical body, material world, fear and security. Then next is Pisces. And Pisces is like about pleasure, sexual pleasure, bed pleasures, enjoyment, but also guilt emotions the sacral chakra feelings of like accepting your emotions and your as they relate to yourself then the third chakra is aries aries the third chakra, the solar plexus think about that it's so obvious to me uh maybe you're not a chakra person so that's why i want to just kind of wrap this up taurus is the heart chakra the fourth chakra gemini is the throat chakra chatty gemini Mercury, fifth chakra. Cancer is the sixth. Intuition, Jivatman, relating to the self in a feminine way. And this is all in the spring. Once you get to Cancer and Gemini, really, too, you're in the summer solstice. And that's the hot, that's the opposite of the winter solstice. Think about how much different the sun and the moon are to Saturn. The fact that the moon is like opposite Saturn. Even think about the fact that. Cancer and Capricorn are opposites, and the Sun and Aquarius are opposites, because Saturn rules Aquarius traditionally in Vedic astrology. Then we have a fall that happens where the Sun starts to move down the Earth's chakras. In Leo, it's spirited, Virgo, throat chakra, Libra, Venus, heart chakra, Scorpio, angry, possessive, obsessive, third chakra, solar plexus, then Sagittarius and Capricorn. So you can see what's going on here, right? Now, what's interesting is when we start to think about how Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto fit into this, there's two possibilities. We're going to talk about the second one once we get past this. The first one is to consider, and it could be true, I'm vying for the second thing, which is this picture here and this picture here. But I just have to speak to the possibility. We could suggest then that since this, with this association of Uranus with Aquarius, Neptune with Pisces, etc., it's possible that Saturn, since Uranus, Capricorn and Aquarius, left. Capricorn and Aquarius make up the first chakra when the sun is in those signs. Uranus, perhaps, is associated with Aquarius, and therefore Uranus is associated with the first chakra. It is a primal, like, obliterating bottom line chakra. Uh, and things that relate with Aquarius can even relate to our physical bodies and to like our basic sense of survival. <clears throat> it has that kind of urgency when it hits us. Nept Neptune. Uh, Neptune would relate with, since Neptune is supposedly ruled, uh, supposedly rules Pisces. Pisces in traditional Vedic astrology is ruled by Jupiter. So Jupiter is the second chakra. Jupiter rules Sagittarius and Pisces, and perhaps Neptune is associated with them. The one that I think is kind of whack, although it's interesting, for Pluto to be associated with the yellow chakra, the solar plexus chakra, and with Mars, being the higher octave of Mars, quote unquote, apparently. Uh, when we think of the solar plexus, we think of possession, we think of fighting for what we deserve and what we own and there's pluto mobster vibes going on there so these associations could be legit uh 
I'm just trying to speak to all the possibilities here because again I'm trying to say that I'm not negating the possibility of these correlations but I'm trying to another thing we I'm trying to show here is that I'm doing by showing you if you know is Uranus connected to the first chakra is Neptune connected to the second with Jupiter is Pluto connected to the third with Pluto by saying all this I'm doing what's precisely wrong with astrology here is I'm making inferences where there might not necessarily be a correlation but how else do we know unless we talk about it right I think a safer bet is that we should consider the possibility that the outer planets were never considered to be part of the embodiment of the six-limbed, twelve-sign zodiac of the human energy field that we have, like, here, right? It's like as if all the other, the first six, the seven luminaries make up the colors of the chakras. The colors and the dimensions of the light body of our energy field. The outer planets instead are possibly deeper evolutionary glyphs of perhaps the seventh chakra, the eighth chakra, the ninth chakra, and beyond if such things exist. I'm just noticing that I've got, I should have flipped so that Uranus is the seventh, Neptune is the eighth, Pluto is the ninth. Maybe the outer planets are systemic. This is the other picture I wanted to show. Maybe they're a systemic evolutionary underpinnings whose connection to our personal spirit is connected with all six chakras at once and all the time, right? Ah, I keep doing that just to see if I'm on track. Pretty interesting, right? That is all things that are grist for our mill, things that we can consider and that we should consider as new astrologers digesting and cross-cultural referencing these planets and what they mean to us as astrologers. So, since there is no inference in scripture of these planets relating to their alleged signs, I would invite everyone to consider what we do know of the outer planets, aside from these unwarranted associations, which ha we have found through Western astrology's rich accounts of observational and intuitive scientists and channelers, such as Edgar Cayce, Jeff Green, uh, Isabel Hickey, Carl Jung, Manly P. Hall, Alistair Crowley, St Stephen Forrest, uh, and the likes of these guys. I want, I'm considering that we should treat them like the greater part of astrology, even in the Vedic tradition. Although I don't know if the, the greater part of Vedic astrology considers Rahu and Ketu as a blank slate. But this is what I'm trying to say. We should consider the outer planets, just like most astrology considers the, the nodes, as a blank slate joker cards, an ace in the deck which has verifiable qualities, but whose qualities cannot be said to correlate elementally or alchemically with the qualities of any of the signs of the zodiac. This is the whole point that I'm trying to say. And why am I getting at that point, do you ask? Not necessarily because I believe there's no correlation, but I'm trying to show functionally, I'm building the framework for what's going to be a functional representation through all the things I showed you in this particular slide here. This little green thing, the principles of Vedic astrology and how to interpret planets and their lord, the outer planets and their lords. This is what I'm going to get to in my next video in this series on the outer planets. The outer planets do have verifiable qualities outside of these associations. I consider them a, a metaphor I had going <clears throat> was like was like this. It's like if you're fishing on a pond and it's a pond full of algae, 
you throw out your fishing lure with a little red and white bobber, the bobber that holds the fishing lure up. You throw out your fishing rod. Let's say the shortest fishing rod is mercury. It's the shortest one from the sun. And we reel it in very quick and it doesn't pick up much algae. It's always transforming and changing and you flick off that algae and you just throw it out there again. The furthest, next for this one is Venus. Next one is Earth. Next, let's say, let's start with Mars, right? Mars is getting further out there. You whip it out, you reel it back in, and it picks up a lot of karma because it's a slower planet. It takes a lot longer for it to shake off the karmas and to have a transformative moment. Mars in transit actually really only hits the planets in your natal chart only once every like two years, right? So the nature trans our relationship to Mars and our, the planets in our nat in our natal chart doesn't meet a confrontation as much as Mercury and Venus and what have you. Uh, I mean, Mercury and Venus are interesting ones because they float around the sun, so they're at the same sort of pace as the sun. But Mars interacts with us from Earth's perspective slower, and then, of course, Jupiter is even slower than that. We whip the fishing rod out, and more algae can collects by the time it comes and actually comes back to us, and we shake it off. Same thing with Saturn. It goes even further out, and as you reel it in, it's harder to reel it in, and it's more, ugh, it's more gunk, more karma to have to deal with, more things I don't want to let go of. And when it finally gets there, it's even heavier to have to let go of all the memories that you've developed on it, because it's so deeply ingrained. Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto are even further than that. By the time when you're trying to reel in a Pluto rod, and you've got like, you've been reeling it in for the past like 10 minutes and you're just like, oh God, like, you know, and there's so much algae, there's so much gunk, there's r rocks and grit and just, ugh, you know, you're basically reeling the whole darn lake by the time you're trying to get Pluto. And all of this is karmic crystallization in you that you haven't changed before. And as Pluto makes transits in our chart, or as we experience a dasha period or a giant, you know, yeah, a dasha period that relates with a planet that is conjunct Pluto, it means that that planet is due for that amount of an algae shakeup. I wonder if this metaphor, you guys can see what I mean. This is a metaphor that I've been working on and I'll develop on it more, but you can see the image I'm getting at. It it's, feels more painful to let go of all the algae that's been, because you, you worked so hard to get that fishing rod close to you that by the time it comes close to you, it's like, look at all of this stuff that I'm just going to let go of. What a waste of all my time and life and energy. I've gotten so used to living in this house, Pluto in the fourth. I've gotten so used to this career, this way of staying alive and surviving, Pluto in the tenth. This way of relating to people, Pluto in the seventh, or you know, uh, another planet which Pluto comes into transit. You know, Pluto is in Capricorn by the time I'm talking about this, and you know, like I'm dealing with Pluto in Capricorn with Saturn, with my own natal Uranus and Neptune. I haven't dealt with Uranus and Neptune in so long, and Pluto going through there was a whole thing. I digress. You guys see where I'm at. There are discernible qualities to these exter outer planets. And I think we should treat them as a blank slate just so that we can kind of deal with them better as a planet in astrology. And that's why I'm treating them as Joker cards or Aces Wild without these associations. But I'll be, I don't know. We'll see how that goes, you know, because if we need... The, these intuitions are here, and we need to experiment with them, and that's why I'm talking about them. And that is why I've spent this whole day talking with you guys, not this whole day, but this whole hour-long session talking with you guys about the outer planets. 
I really hope that you guys enjoyed this conversation about the outer planets and their lords from the tropical Vedic astrology perspective. Stay tuned because the real juicy stuff is going to come up when we actually start to quantify what it is that makes and defines your experience of these outer planets based on the figures in your chart, the lord of the, the place where these planets are, the strength of the planets that they're associated with, etc. Let me know in the comments what you guys think. This is a very exciting time to be alive in astrology, and it's exciting for me because I've dis I'm discovering these link-ups that I'm just so excited to hear what people think. So I'm all ears, I'm all eyes on your comments, uh, and I'm completely open to everyone's rendition of me being crazy, me being an idiot, me being whatever you think, I would love to hear it. Because as astrologers in today's time, we're not gonna, we can't see our own blind spots. If we have YouTube, we're not gonna know where to go with our practice and with our healing modalities until we talk about it with other people who are also interested in it. Thanks a lot for watching, folks.